First of all, uh, I'm James Guderian. and I um, direct this uh, program uh, that's hosting this wonderful event, the Innovating Global Security and Global Media. Um, and now to our benefactors, Carnegie Corporation of uh, New York, which made this possible. So I'd like to welcome you all. Et bienvenue. Um, je ne voudrais pas uh, parler en français parce que. Parce que j'ai appris. La langue, la langue de la diplomatie. J'ai appris la langue à Québec. Et my, my French friends say my accent sounds like chalk on a blackboard. So, so, uh, also, parce que uh, we have a wonderful co host um, who speaks um, French, of course, from Sciences Po, Philippe Bonditi, um, who will uh, present his own aperçu uh, after I um, give you a brief introduction to our two distinguished guests, and um, they'll be speaking in the order of uh, Pierre, Professor Pierre Hausman first, and then Professor Stanley Hoffman. Um, and I guess, um, the way, by way of introducing this, I'd like to quote someone who had a profound influence on both of our guests today, and not someone you hear cited very frequently in American international relations, and that's Raymond Deron. Uh, Raymond Deron, who, whose magisterial um, piece in war, um, reshaped, I think, international relations the way it was being studied, certainly in, in Europe, and to the extent that uh, it made its way over the Atlantic in certain quarters of North America as well. Um, he uh, said the following, how does one live according to reason if the other, the foreigner, whether remote or nearby, may burst into one's world at any moment? Now, I think both of our distinguished guests have spent a long, lustrous career addressing this issue, but more importantly, they've shown the shortcomings of reason. That if you try to impose rational models on a recalcitrant reality, it can be as much a part of the problem as part of the solution. That's why I'm particularly delighted to have them both here today to talk about the limits of reason, the limits of reason and why we need to understand the passions that so often have um, reconfigured international politics passions of fear, of hope. Uh, we might even uh, delve into emotions we rarely talk about uh, in the Q&A, I hope, as well as love and affection, empathy, um, and why we should make that as much part of our um, models of international relations as rational choice. So that's by way of an introduction. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Philippe Bonditi, who will be introducing the uh, Cosmo. my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Pierre Hartner from the Center for International Studies and Research at Sciences Po in Paris. And to start, I would just like to mention um, that in 1977, um, in a famous paper published in De Vellis Journal, Professor Stanley Hoffman discussing <coughs> international relations as an American social science mentioned Professor Hartner as one of those, I quote, brilliant individual contributions to IR coming from Europe. Today, if there should be any French school of international relations, or if that should make any sense, Professor Hosmer would most surely be its most legitimate presentator. After he joined France in the early 40s, in the late 40s, sorry, to escape the arbitrariness of power and totalitarianism in communist Romania, Pierre Hosmer became a student of the very distinguished École Normale Supérieure and Professor Agrégé in Philosophy in 1955, the highest distinction in the French academic arena. Close collaborator of the French sociologist and historian Raymond Aron, Professor Hosmer then became a Rockefeller Fellow in the United States between 1956 and 1959. This is when he first met Professor Stanley Hoffman. What makes Professor Hasna an example for all of us beyond its uh, unpretentiousness and its extreme kindness is certainly its general stance in front of contemporary world politics. Never too far or disconnected from their main object, never too close, never radical, always well-balanced, 
Professor Hustner's encompassing analysis of contemporary world politics have the characteristic to engage with the very pragmatic dimension of power and violence, while in the same time being rooted in political philosophy and theory. Close reader of two cities, Hobbes, Rousseau, Kant, Nietzsche, Hegel, Arendt, Professor Hosner not only has offered work of reference on power, totalitarianism, and violence, but also provided us with extremely insightful analysis of the war in ex Yugoslavia, in Iraq, and the current, current war in Afghanistan. Exploring the inextricability of human relations, the spatial temporal rearticulations of power, the dialectic of the bourgeois and the barbarian, and now the dialectic of passions, Professor Hosner seems to be constantly worrying about turning abstract and theoretical analysis into a clear and accessible knowledge about the world in the making. Author of many reference academic articles, Professor Hosner is also the author of Violence and Peace, From the Atomic Bomb to the Ethnic Cleaning, as well as of the not yet translated La Terreur et l'Empire, Terror and the Empire, which are two collections of his most important essays. They are now a reference in the field. So please join me welcoming Professor Hasner, who will present today on the theme, Tamed or Unleashed, the dialectic of passions in today's crisis and conflict. Uh, with uh, the end of 
uh, a wave or two. Uh, then uh, I uh, uh, tried uh, without uh, any success to understand uh, the, uh, the contagion and the reactions to passion through the years like 1848, 1968, 1989, uh, when uh, where something is a fruit and uh, is interpreted uh, sometimes in national terms, in social terms, Passion Train 
but uh, mostly I'm thinking here of uh, what I've uh, done uh, on uh, what I think uh, is perhaps not so uh, well known as such. Here I think there is a, a French uh, uh, liberal uh, tradition of interpretation or prefiguration of totalitarianism, which we would say Elia Levi, I don't know if it's well known uh, here, it's well known in, in England, uh, uh, who wrote uh, uh, Les Tyrannies, uh, the uh, Tyrannies and the History of European uh, Socialism, and uh, his interpretation of the war, uh, of the First World War, is above all uh, uh, the unleashing of collective passions. Uh, Aron, who in a book which I think is a bit forgotten, I, I think in a way it's uh, maybe to some extent the best book, Les Guerres Archaines, The Century of Total War, <coughs> it exists in uh, English, and it's, uh, I think, a uh, uh, wonderful uh, um, show, much more than uh, uh, the war is the peace and war, which I find a little bit static, but uh, there about the dynamic between uh, uh, war, which starts as a, uh, as a failure of the diplomatic system, then uh, there is a technological surprise, there is propaganda, uh, there is uh, uh, the state uh, issuing, uh, uh, the, the, uh, becoming a uh, Economy, there are the revolutions, and the revolutions themselves, not necessarily, but uh, lead uh, to the dialectic of the extremes and uh, to the uh, other war. So the, this kind of uh, interplay between the domestic and the, um, uh, and the uh, international, which you doesn't see so well in peace and war, is uh, seen admirably, I think, in the Russian. <coughs> and uh, Fure uh, has started from uh, Tocqueville, says the 19th century, is dominated by the bourgeoisie, but the bourgeoisie brings uh, the, uh, um, constant criticism and uh, hatred, including uh, by sons of the bourgeoisie, and uh, this uh, can go in the direction of socialism or of nationalism, can, uh, uh, can go the same passions he uh, tries to say, uh, produce fascism and communism, although he says himself that it's a, a pathology or uh, one is a pathology of the universal, the other of the particular, or as Kolakowski says, uh, uh, one is uh, uh, a monstrous uh, child of the Enlightenment, the other the monstrous child of Romanticism. But however that may be, uh, one criticizes uh, the bourgeois uh, liberal world because uh, uh, it sees in, the, in it the decay of, uh, 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 of the great uh, creativity and of uh, struggling heroism and so on of an elite, uh, despises the masses and the other uh, sees a false uh, equality and uh, uh, takes, uh, uh, as uh, the 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 party of the malheureux, of the masses, uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, when he continue, uh, continues uh, that, uh, I will go through the uh, evolution uh, uh, about the two uh, totalitarian movements and the uh, two uh, world wars. Uh, but uh, uh, to uh, get uh, to, uh, to uh, what is uh, essentially uh, the, the present, uh, uh, that is the, the illusion of a dispassionate uh, uh, world, which in, uh, in uh, uh, international relations theory, as uh, uh, Professor Berberian alluded to, uh, it translates into uh, rational uh, choice uh, um, and everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the reality uh, of uh, uh, the passions uh, being, uh, being there and uh, uh, being uh, uh, making themselves uh, felt again in a, a very, um, in a very uh, uh, obvious uh, way. Uh, so this, um, well, this is uh, where I, um, uh, I, I would like uh, um, briefly uh, as, I, as I can, to say uh, um, a, couple, a few words on the, the way the basic passions as distinguished by Thucydides, Hobbes, uh, uh, and others about uh, fear and the desire of security, of uh, the glory, pride, or humiliation, and uh, uh, greed uh, are uh, in a kind of uh, uh, dialectic. The, uh, 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 fear, uh, I will uh, speak about it in, in particular. I just uh, uh, want to uh, um, uh, throw in uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, ideas. One, uh, the idea of the fear of fear. Uh, the, uh, Roosevelt said uh, nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, uh, the French philosopher Alain was saying also, la peur est toujours la peur de la peur, uh, which uh, uh, may lead precisely in order to uh, overcome your fear, uh, you uh, launch into adventure and you, uh, you launch into uh, brutality and so on. And 
differently. We also need to between the, the great, uh, gra great fears and the sm uh, small fears, which uh, French sociologist uh, Gamora uh, made, saying uh, uh, you had the great panic, uh, the end of the world, uh, the, uh, the plague, uh, and so on, uh, in uh, other times, other cultures. Now uh, uh, it's replaced by our, our small uh, fears about uh, uh, our dignity or about uh, Diet, uh, uh, and so on. And the question is whether we have a renaissance of the, the, of the big fears uh, uh, or whether it's different. So I uh, leave that uh, to, uh, to Stanley, but I go in immediately to another combination which is extremely powerful, uh, uh, which is that of fear and uh, hatred. Uh, the French uh, writer, Robert Ranoff, uh, who witnessed uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Spanish Civil War uh, and says uh, uh, fe uh, fear, the real fear is uh, c'est un délire que uh, uh, living uh, in, in fear uh, you, uh, you uh, uh, are constantly you build up uh, uh, an enemy and then uh, you, uh, uh, you attack him in uh, uh, preventive uh, genocide uh, we, w we must kill them before they kill us uh, uh, which one saw in uh, one guy one saw in uh, uh, Milosevic uh, um, uh, and so on and uh, this uh, uh, link uh, between the two, uh, I think, is again uh, one of the uh, dialectics which one uh, um, uh, can uh, um, point out. The one uh, on which I was most interested and which has uh, some relevance, uh, in, uh, particularly now, uh, are uh, connected with uh, um, pride and, uh, um, and uh, humiliation. Uh, but uh, first I would uh, uh, like uh, uh, to put this general term that there is a kind of version of uh, uh, the passions or reaction on, the, on themselves. So the fear of fear can uh, lead to adventure and to cruelty, the pain of uh, the uh, hatred of uh, hatred to the hatred of those who hate, uh, the pity for the victims to the cruelty about uh, uh, those uh, uh, who uh, make them suffer. There is a wonderful uh, sentence which Hannah Arendt quotes of a, a committee or uh, a, a letter to the Jacobins at the time of the uh, which says, par pitié, par amour de l'humanité, soyez inhumains. Uh, out of uh, pity, out of love for humanity, please be inhuman. So there is uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the um, um, the, uh, uh, and uh, Ernest Gellner spoke of the disenchantment with disenchantment. Uh, when uh, the passions have, have gone, you, you uh, finally are uh, disenchanted uh, with the absence of, uh, of uh, passions. But uh, on uh, the particular dialectic on which I want to uh, insist is uh, uh, that of uh, uh, contempt uh, and uh, uh, humiliation and uh, uh, resentment. Uh, the uh, most uh, violent conflict is uh, by the, the, uh, those who dominate and who fear, uh, who, uh, fear the losing their domination and those who are oppressed and who uh, want uh, their, uh, their, uh, their uh, revenge. And wh why uh, what I uh, what uh, comes to, uh, to mind uh, then uh, is uh, uh, very much uh, this uh, um, kind of uh, um, uh, double uh, misunderstanding uh, between uh, the uh, um, identity forming uh, uh, passions and uh, uh, the uh, uh, utilitarian calculus on uh, uh, essentially search for pleasure, uh, pleasure and pain. Uh, it seems to me, or it was already the case in Vietnam, it's a case uh, in attitudes of uh, uh, totalitarian countries towards uh, liberal democracies. It's a case uh, uh, now, I think, also in Afghanistan, that uh, uh, you always uh, think uh, that the other will be dominated either by greed or by fear, whereas you uh, are uh, uh, dominated by uh, saying 
system, a kind of uh, calculus I, I don't do or I give you money and uh, uh, you choose. And uh, that's what, yeah. uh, uh, that's what uh, happened, uh, uh, happens, I think, uh, um, constantly. Uh, this uh, um, way of, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, um, bonding uh, and uh, uh, trying to buy, buy off, which uh, um, uh, probably uh, never uh, succeed. As, uh, as I, I uh, knew I'm uh, at the end of my time uh, without, uh, uh, yeah, uh, without uh, uh, having gone uh, to, to the end, but I, I, I wanted to say I, I won't develop uh, uh, Philippe uh, uh, may mentioned that this uh, uh, dialectic between the bourgeois and either the barbarian or the fanatic or, or whatever, but the bourgeois who uh, wants uh, 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 the doesn't like the heroic virtue, so he delegates to technology or to mercenaries uh, uh, and so on, or who uh, he appeals to try to redirect uh, uh, the uh, pre-capitalist uh, things like uh, from the Western bring them on uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, the, uh, uh, the almost uh, um, uh, uh, fantastic uh, move, which may make me modify my dialectic now, is the drone or the robot versus the human bomb. I think the, the most uh, 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 symbolic thing was this uh, Jordanian who uh, 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 may was a tribal agent. He was uh, writing uh, uh, violent articles against uh, the Americans but uh, telling the Americans that he was doing that as a cover and uh, 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 enlisting uh, uh, with them, going to Afghanistan, and then blowing himself uh, up uh, with uh, 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 a group from the CIA which was about to launch drones on, uh, on, uh, on Afghanistan. So uh, this, I, I think, uh, uh, there is a possibility of uh, two sides becoming more like uh, each other, either the bourgeoisie or some, uh, or the, uh, the uh, fanaticization or the barbarization, as the case may be, uh, of the other. But there may be also this kind of uh, uh, two worlds uh, uh, being uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in conflict. One, uh, this kind of impersonal awareness, uh, one say you would see probably uh, things with uh, uh, the men who uh, have lunch at home, uh, those Philosophies, uh, his uh, screen and send uh, a few drones and goes back to, he, to his family uh, and, uh, and uh, the other extreme, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, suicide uh, killings uh, and, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, in uh, one word, the economic crisis, I'm saved by the wrong because I don't know anything about economics, but uh, <laughs> uh, still uh, it is. Uh, um, uh, it, it is still striking if one sees it from uh, uh, from the uh, side of the uh, uh, fashions. It's uh, greed and hubris, uh, uh, followed by anxiety and, uh, and anger. Uh, greed, uh, uh, the essence of capitalism, is supposed to be delayed satisfaction in long term, and uh, now there is immediate uh, uh, satisfaction. The, 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 the desire to avoid any risk which uh, means, uh, uh, leads to the greater, uh, uh, greater risk uh, and, and so forth. I, uh, in the discussion with uh, Ken Tuk, there are interesting things in case and so say there about, uh, um, uh, about that. But uh, the, um, the uh, uh, point is, uh, and this is where I want to finish, uh, I have the impression still uh, that uh, the uh, dominating thing is uh, still uh, the uh, 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 economic and the economic tensions and uh, uh, so forth, but uh, there is an undercurrent uh, of uh, anger which uh, has different uh, things. There is no uh, political negation. Politics is in a, uh, in a very poor state uh, everywhere, uh, but uh, uh, there are uh, various uh, um, Varieties uh, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, anger uh, in uh, um, Europe and in the West. It, it seems to me there are terms above all uh, inside. If one sees uh, with liberation uh, and so the transformation in two European countries, Holland and uh, Italy, uh, where uh, simply the immigration and so on creates uh, really uh, a mood of uh, hysteria against uh, uh, foreigners, which is absolutely unexpected in the, uh, these two uh, countries. Uh, here we have the, the, the tea parties and so on. There is a, a, a kind of simmering uh, anger. Um, the German philosopher K. 
Rotter Brandt ist äh, nicht mehr ironisch, äh, Buch äh, und äh, sein, äh, sein und äh, Zorn ist äh, noch lange Zeit, Seeing äh, äh, and Anger. And uh, here's a uh, funny formulation, uh, saying there are reserves of anger uh, every time, and there are banks of anger which are collecting your anger and trying to uh, use it uh, to invest it in something. So the Catholic Church was a, a, a bank of anger, and the, the communist uh, communism was a bank of anger, and now the anger is more diffused, uh, one might say it's uh, Islam is, uh, is one, but uh, uh, is uh, there and one uh, and, uh, doesn't know uh, how and where it will uh, intervene. But there is still uh, the uh, anger uh, uh, of the damned, as uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, Turkish uh, writer Panyuk uh, uh, formulated, the anger of those who like the wrong view think uh, they have always been uh, uh, dominated, oppressed, and exploited, and now they come uh, their time. So there are these different uh, types of uh, anger. One shouldn't uh, become apocalyptic, but I stress that uh, uh, some people, uh, Apadula in his first book on globalization was very optimistic. His second is called The Geography of Anger, and he uh, shows uh, the, uh, uh, especially uh, the uh, richer minorities, which are uh, uh, taken as scapegoats, and, uh, and so on. There are several books like that, uh, uh, people uh, who go into this apocalyptic direction, I don't think, I think the uh, even the uh, anger uh, is uh, limited and uh, minority, but still, uh, there is a speech by uh, Tom Bill uh, in the parliament in 1848, just before 1848, he says, there is no passion here, there is just uh, interest and so on, don't you feel uh, that it should be better, you, you should have political uh, passions, uh, uh, which we, we can handle, and uh, uh, this uh, absence of, of passion may hide uh, an explosion of passion which is uh, coming. So uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, a good uh, um, memory, and uh, I hope not uh, the time for video of this before. <laughs>
also currently teaching a course on Camus in French. Um, and um, he has taught, I think, one of the most renowned courses in international relations, uh, international relations and ethics at Harvard for a considerable amount of time. Um, and um, he has produced many graduate students who've gone on to do great things in the field of international relations. But also, um, you can find many of his students uh, in the international global media, which I mentioned because that's one of the other things we do here at the Watson Institute, like uh, a co colleague of mine, Mark Whitaker, who is the chair of uh, he's the managing editor of Newsweek for many years. Uh, many in the current administration um, went to Stanley's courses and even um, were advised by him. And so um, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say he's both shaped through his writing for the New Yorker, I'm sorry, the New York Review of Books, through his um, scholarly work, but also through his pedagogy, a whole generation of IR scholars. So we're delighted to have him here today to speak again on, on passions. Um, and um, after um, Professor Hoffman speaks, we'll have a Q&A session. So please join me in welcoming uh, Stanley Hoffman. to understand what's happening in the world, which I find almost uh, 
Um, I don't know the law. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, if you uh, have married me to the imperialism, you know that uh, uh, the, a uh, the people uh, who are afraid uh, in international affairs, well, it's the states, uh, uh, because of their mutual and, and rival ambition. I think there have unfortunately been two new realities which complicate the game a little bit. Uh, there have been two revolutions. One is uh, globalization, uh, the speed of communications, the desire that most countries have, uh, except if they are uh, monstrosities like Burma, uh, and there are not that many, for that kind of reason, uh, desire for prosperity and development which requires participating in an open economy, uh, which means essentially delocalization of politics. Uh, you could, uh, in, uh, a few centuries ago, um, focus on Western Europe. Eastern Europe intervened from time to time when the Russians uh, acted. But most of the time, uh, the, the scope in which one provides, I mean, uh, of one provides was limited. This is no longer the case. Uh, the other revolution, of course, uh, which is probably understudied because it's very uh, new uh, and uh, it would require something which is much more tiring than theory. It requires research. <laughs> uh, and that's the uh, um, development of international non-state actors. There is a very brilliant book which I recommend to you. Uh, it's a book of a, a young man who is now at the Society of Fellows. He's, I think, one of the two political scientists who have been admitted into the Harvard uh, Society of Fellows in the last 40 years. His name is David, uh, is G-R-E-W-A-L. There is some considerable hesitation about how he pronounces it. But I think it's William. And the book uh, uh, is called Network Power, and is a remarkably uh, comprehensive, well-written, very important, uh, intelligent book on it. But it's the most comprehensive so far, and there's need for <coughs> much more. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, because of the role of non-state uh, uh, actors that you have today this Washington conference, which is trying to uh, deal with uh, the formidable problem of nuclear weapons uh, falling into private hands. In other words, the result of a combination of globalization and non-state actors is that fear has become, uh, to use a, uh, an expression that uh, the French used about uh, their nuclear force when they developed it, it's pointed to their limit. Fear is universal. Uh, and, uh, and, and generalized. So that brings me to my second point, whose fear? Well, yesterday's, it was largely the elite which are active in foreign affairs. And this was not the concern of most people. <coughs> and uh, it was the elite for reasons either of trade or as guardian of nati national security. And this was true even in 1914. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a movie fan, and I've seen a number of movies that deal, uh, sometimes in passing, uh, with the uh, kind of uh, non-transition from peacetime activities uh, in different countries. And suddenly the war appears. I saw last week a German movie, which I do not recommend to you, even though it's very good. It's just horrible. Uh, if you want nightmares, go see that movie. It's called The White Ribbon. It has nothing to do with international affairs. It has to do with, well, I'm still shivering from it, of German society before 1914. It takes place somewhere in northern Germany. And uh, it's a mystery. Uh, it, it is a mystery which is left unresolved. Uh, and it describes a system of both parent-children relations and class relations, uh, which is enough to uh, make one sick, and which the direct 
So, except for one very, very tiny hint, does not openly present uh, as a premature explanation of future Nazis. But what is interesting in that movie, and it's true in a much nicer, in my opinion, and a more pleasant French movie based on the novel, uh, and the movie is called uh, uh, At My Age, I'm Losing My, my Memory of Everything, as of particularly of names of people whom I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> what is left only is telephone. <laughs> but that French movie was called uh, The Silon Fiancaille. Uh, uh, it exists in English. It's uh, about a, it's a World War I drama. Uh, but in both movies, what is so striking is how unexpected that war was for the aggressor. So, uh, these are in, in this German uh, story, suddenly, you know, war comes and they're all sent to the front, which is a good thing, because otherwise they would all have ended mother nature. But that's it, no transition, because it was a problem of elites. Uh, today, everybody is afraid. Democracy has prevailed, if not anything. Look at the current United States. I have had the impression, I haven't, one of the reasons I haven't written anything or something like this yet, is that I don't know what to do with this country. Uh, it horrifies me. Uh, I think it has an extraordinary presence uh, uh, by all means. And, and look what's happening. You have this extraordinary combination of two things which are, in principle, if you're a rationalist, incompatible. You have something which was, uh, which one no normally attributes to Tocqueville, but frankly, Tocqueville did a lot of borrowing. And you know that he borrowed from somebody when he doesn't mention if it's somebody whom he doesn't really, uh, didn't influence him much, he mentions it. But if it's somebody who influenced him greatly, he mentions our people. <laughs> and the person in this respect who influenced him was my Jean Constant, a, a much under, underrated writer. But Constant and Tocqueville both had this idea of what Tocqueville called the democratic individualism, the citizen who is only concerned with his own affairs, the lack of citizenship. Of civil, of civic affairs, and the concentration on oneself. If you look at them, uh, at American uh, newspapers, I'm not uh, mentioning the two or three which are readable. I'm mentioning those which people read, uh, and uh, it is extraordinary and, and, and terrifying. And uh, that's exactly what Tocqueville was worried about. Uh, the absence of civic concern, partly because people are, are not being properly educated as citizens of a democracy, but that's the other story. But this goes hand in hand, so to speak, with something which in principle should be incompatible with it, which is this sharp ideological split, which one uh, is uh, sub uh, objected to right now. And the result, it seems to me, is that everybody, uh, uh, or many people, uh, have moved from complacency. We are the greatest, we are the best, we have the best health system in the world. Ha, ha. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm saying, ha, ha, because I spent two days in France in January. The first thing I did was to fall flat on my face and to end up in a hospital, which uh, I realized that there was that nothing that happened to me except I was bleeding like a pig. Nobody asked who I was. Nobody asked me to pay a thing. Nobody asked me to sign anything. And the staff, nurses, and doctors were a mix of Francais de France, French, and North African. And it was almost impossible to distinguish who was who. That was it. That was a one day experience. Try to do this here. Anyhow. So <laughs> you have this extraordinary. Uh, current situation, uh, which means that uh, for many people they have moved in very little time from complacency to hysteria. Um, uh, I still can uh, uh, try to understand what the Tea Parties are about, but I gather they think that the government spends too much money. I don't know what they would say if tomorrow uh, their uh, Medicare or Medicaid contributions were cut. The one thing which is clear is that they don't want 35 more million people to be insured. Now that is, uh, uh, and they are 
that in many cases where they had sent aid or forces or whatever, uh, they didn't accomplish what they were supposed to accomplish. So there's a problem of knowledge, there's a problem of means, and the combination of the two uh, means of largely inefficiency and not weighing as much uh, as they should. Uh, I think what one needs almost desperately in this kind of world is try to create a zone, I wouldn't say without fear, there's never a zone without fear, but a zone in which um, uh, the kind of daily fears for one's survival or for one's security uh, do not affect one's life. And, uh, and uh, 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 the one example I can give which is much maligned in, in the few American papers that even know of its existence. And honestly, I find it infuriating. Every day on the last two weeks, they announced that the Europeans were divided, as if the Americans were, uh, announced that uh, they would let uh, 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 the poor Greeks uh, without any aid, and that would spread, and uh, publishing articles about how the duo is an uh, impediment to well, it so happens that uh, it didn't turn out that way. It turned out relatively well. But, and of course there are problems in those countries, uh, including uh, the problems of immigration and of the fears which people have, because pe people will always ask me, there's no way of, of curing everybody of the fear of the other who's different. Uh, and uh, so, uh, take this recently uh, successful book of Christopher Caldwell, who explains basically that the, uh, that the Muslims are going to take over Europe, it is absolute nonsense. Uh, the numbers aren't there, to put it mildly. And if you take uh, the one case I know, which is that of France, what the uh, bulk, first of all, the bulk of the Muslims are not religious fanatics, because they are Muslims as a lay as the bulk of France. And secondly, all they are, are asking for is to be treated as citizens when they are French citizens, as many of them are. So, um, sure, you can't eliminate all of them, but the EU has eliminated a lot, including Mr. Mearsheimer's fear about Germany and France being at each other's throat together. Uh, and in fact, that has led the uh, Mrs. Uh, Merkel uh, to accept uh, having her back uh, tapped and rubbed by Sarkozy in a way which would have provoked war before 1914. <laughs> <laughs> so one needs these kinds of zones without fear. Um, it's hard to create, but it seems to me that is one thing we should think about. So to conclude, I think we do need uh, a geography and a psychology of emotions, indeed, passions, fears, rather than relying on oversimplified concepts. And uh, the concepts, which I find increasingly inadequate, are concepts like rational choice and self-interest. Um, as a member of the Harvard faculty, as faculty meetings have been exposed, to quite a number of sessions in which our um, economists uh, told us that uh, the undergraduates don't need a uh, core curriculum uh, because the only thing the only thing they need is what uh, all of them is a course in economics, a course which is not an intervention, which will tell them that all people are alike, want the same thing, which is their self-interest. And therefore, we therefore know that what is good for us is good for them. At which point I exploded, I confess, got up and said, uh, you are a young man, I'm quite old, I've lived a little longer, and the more I live, the more I find it very different, even in one room. So uh, I don't think that uh, what we have proven uh, is that all people want the same thing. If you were right, um, it would be uh, it would explain why the United States has been so successful 